When I first began into the work, I left California and I was traveling with another minister and we were going through the south. And on one particular occasion, we went to visit some people down in Florida. And one of them was a member of our church. And we had never met her before. Neither one of us have met her before, and I was wondering, how are we going to recognize her? We went to this place where she was working, in this high-rise, and she came down the elevator, and as we were waiting around, I asked the brother, how are we going to know who this person is going to be? And he said, don't worry, we will know. And as we were looking at all the people that were coming out of the elevator, all of a sudden, one person walked out, and the brother said, that's her. We recognized her immediately because of the way she dressed. Now today we're going to study a little bit about dress reform. The reasons that we as a people have adopted certain principles of dress reform. Now I want you to keep in mind this is not a very easy topic because it comes close to very many people's hearts. Fashion is a very difficult subject to talk about. But I want to make sure that we t when we talk about this subject we're not going to share our personal opinions. We're going to simply share what God has written. And keep in mind that our God is a God of love. Never on any occasion does He write or tell us to do something that is not for our own benefit. Sometimes if we would only see the end from the beginning, we would really be able to understand the reasons for the statements that God has given to us. We would be able to say, yes, God is love and praise the Lord for the rules that He has laid down for our living. In the first place, I'd like us to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18. It says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord had Christ of Belial? Or what part had he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement had the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God had said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. This verse talks about we as being the temple of the living God. And God says here, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God wants to live with us. God wants to live in our temple. Now how long does God want to live in our temple? Let us look at Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 to 3. Revelation 21 verses 1 to 3. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. Oh, what a wonderful picture of the holy city coming down to this earth and God tabernacling with us, God living with us. You see, God says, you are my temple, and God wants to live with us throughout all eternity. Now, since God wants to live with us throughout all eternity, what does He want us to do with this temple that we have carrying with us? Let us look again at 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17. I want to read that verse again just to reemphasize what God wants us to do because He wants to live with us. It says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. 
God wants to live with us, but He wants us to be separate from anything that is unclean. And only under these conditions, under the condition that we are separate from those things which are unclean, only when we are separate from all the unclean things of this world, does verse 18 say, And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. God wants us to be His children. But we are not His children until we fulfill the conditions. We all may say, Oh, I am a child of God. It says here, And I will be a father unto you. When? After we come out from among them and be ye separate. First, there is separation in order for us to be His children. In Volume 2, Testing for the Church, page 441. Volume 2, page 441. Christ's followers are required to come out from the world and be separate and touch not the unclean. And they have the promise of being sons and daughters of the Most High, members of the royal family. God requires His children to come out from the world and be separate. Separation is a requirement that God has given to us. And then we have the promise of being sons and daughters of the Most High, members of the royal family. Do you want to be a child of the King? Do you want to be a member of the family of God? Then there's a requirement here, and that requirement is to come out from the world and be separate. It goes on and says, But if the conditions are not complied with on their part, they will not, they cannot realize the fulfillment of the promise. A profession of Christianity is nothing in the sight of God, but true, humble, willing obedience to His requirements designates the children of His adoption, the recipients of His grace, the partakers of His great salvation. Such will be peculiar, a spectacle unto the world, to angels and to men. Their peculiar holy character will be discernible and will distinctly separate them from the world, from its affections and lusts. Now we have been eagerly waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We are eagerly waiting for the time that the latter rain will come upon us to give us power to go into all the world to finish this work because we all want to go home. We want to go up and possess the land that God has promised to our forefathers. But you know something? What is the condition upon which the latter rain will come upon us? What is the condition that will be able to give us that power to present the gospel to the world? Let us look at an example from the early Christian church. In Great Controversy, page 46. Great Controversy, page 46. It says, The early Christians were indeed a peculiar people. Their blameless deportment and unswerving faith were a continual reproof that disturbed the sinner's peace. And now listen to this. Though few in numbers, without wealth, position, or honorary titles, they were a terror to evildoers wherever their character and doctrines were known. Wherever the character and doctrines coupled together were known, they were a terror to evildoers. It scared a world to death. You see, it wasn't character alone because in one of our future studies we're going to notice that character is a result of pure doctrine. So, first comes a knowledge of of the pure doctrine and then comes a character unless you and I have this experience a doctrine coupled together with a pure character we will not be a terror to anyone we will not be able to share the gospel to the whole world with effectiveness but the early Christian church had it and if we want to experience the power of the latter rain we need to experience this same Thing. So when we talk about separation, what type of question should we have in regard to separation? 
What kind of question should I ask myself? Here's a very important question that we need to think about in Volume 1, page 278. Volume 1, Testing for the Church, page 278. In regard to fashion, it says, Let the fashion change, and convenience will no longer be mentioned. It is the duty of every child of God to inquire, Wherein am I separate from the world? What's the question? We need to examine our hearts and find out how, wherein am I separate from the world. Let us suffer a little inconvenience and be on the safe side. Isn't it important to be on the safe side? In the regard to this question, we have some examples of Jesus that we should be thinking for ourselves. Let's look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gave some important thoughts here for us. Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. It is impossible to have the world in one hand and God in another hand. This is an impossibility. You cannot have the best of both worlds. Either you have God or you do not have Him at all. And in regard to this question of the world and mammon, Jesus brought this thought in verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? So it says, think not for what? For the things that we shall eat, drink, and wear. It is very interesting that as you drive down the road, what do you see very frequently? You see restaurants where there is eating and drinking, and you see fashion shops. Those are two things that you see constantly. What Jesus says here, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, or for your body, what you shall put on. Those three things are things that the world is fully preoccupied with. They have no time for anything else. I remember sharing with an individual some years ago about how important it is for them to take some time to study the Word of God every day. I told them, you need to at least spend a little time every day in the Word of God. And they said, yes, but I have no time I thought to myself, well, get up a little bit earlier, maybe in the morning, and you can spend a little time with God if there is no other time during the day. And they said, oh no, I already get up at, I think it was like four or five in the morning. And I said, well, what time do you have to be at work? They said, eight o'clock. Well, how far is your work? Oh, about half an hour to 45 minutes away. Well, what do you do all morning? And she said, well, I'm busy preparing my hair. You know, all their time was spent on this outward thing. God says, take no thought. Now, it does not mean that we do not care what we eat and what we drink. Because in verse 26 says, Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? We find here that... It does not mean we don't care because the Father takes care of us. It simply means that we should not be preoccupied with such things. We should not be preoccupied with eating, drinking, and dressing. When we want to talk about dress reform, to understand the principles of why we adopt certain things in dress reform, the best place that I can think of is to go back to the beginning. You see, back in the beginning, in the creation, everything was created perfect. And it is only as everything is created perfect, if we ever want to look back at a model of perfection in this world, that is the only time that we have to look back at. Ever since the Garden of Eden, we have been experiencing a fall from morality. So any time after that, we cannot really look at that as a perfect example. We can only look back at the Garden of Eden. And now, 
when we talk about the Garden of Eden, what was dress reform like in the Garden of Eden? What was it like? Let us look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. When God created Adam and Eve, how did He create them? Let's look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. Genesis 1 and verse 27. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God created He him. Male and female created He them. So in the very beginning, when our Heavenly Father created this world, He created it in His own image. Now, what is the image of God like in regards to dress? Because obviously God has an image. When it says here we were created in His image, that means that we are in the same likeness that God is. And what does God, our Heavenly Father, what does He wear? Let us look at Psalm 104, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 104, verses 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, Thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. What does our Creator, what does God wear? It says He is clothed with honor, He is clothed with majesty, and He covers Himself with light as a garment. So, honor, majesty, and a robe of light. Therefore, if our first parents were created in the image of God, they also must have been created with honor, majesty, and a garment of light. They were surely created with honor, and they were also with majesty, because back in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, we find that they had a rulership. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis 1, verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So they had dominion, and therefore they had majesty. They also had light. When we often, when I look at pictures about the Garden of Eden, about our first parents, I always see pictures of them walking around naked with nothing on. But when did they have nothing on? When were they naked? Let us look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7. Genesis 3 and verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So here in this verse it says, they now saw that they were naked. Now you may think, well, in Genesis chapter 2 verse 25 says they were naked. And it says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Yes, obviously if we compare these two passages, there is still a difference in their nakedness. In chapter 2, verse 15, obviously they had no clothing on as we know it. But in chapter 3, verse 7, obviously they lost something. Something was lost between Adam and Eve, and they saw that they were naked. In Spirit of Prophecy, volume 1, page 40, Spirit of Prophecy, volume 1, page 40, describes what they lost. God instructed our first parents in regard to the tree of knowledge. And they were fully informed relative to the fall of Satan and the danger of listening to his suggestions. He did not deprive them of the power of eating the forbidden fruit. He left them as free moral agents to believe his word, obey his commandments and live, or believe the tempter, disobey and perish. They both ate, and the great wisdom they obtained was the knowledge of sin and a sense of guilt.
the covering of light about them soon disappeared. And under a sense of guilt and loss of their divine covering, a shivering seized them and they tried to cover their exposed forms. So what happened here? It says that the covering of light about them soon disappeared. It was gone. So in the very beginning, we were created in the image of God. We did have a covering of light. Light was around us, around our first parents. And it was only when sin came in that they lost this covering of light. So, if we take a look at what was really happening in the first place, God created us in His image. In the image of God. This image of God consisted a covering of light. Clothing of light. Then came a time that sin entered the world. Our first parents committed sin. It was only after sin that there was the introduction of nakedness. And what happened when our first parents realized that they were naked? What did they do and why did they do it? Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, let's again read verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed together fig leaves and made themselves aprons. So they made themselves fig leaves. This was the introduction of mini skirts and a pair of shorts. Now, where was the problem here? The problem was that they were about to enter into the presence of God. We are talking here about our first parents. We're about to go and meet together with God. And in the sanctuary that they had, as they were about to go meet into the direct presence of God, they realized that they were unprepared as naked. And so what they did, they realized they have to go to God, so what they did, they did the best that human beings could do. They put on fig leaves. They made themselves aprons. Well, God did come to them. God did introduce Himself to our first parents. And as He introduced Himself to them, God gave them a precious revelation, something that was about to happen in the future. Let's look at Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15. God came to our first parents. Yes, they came to them in their fig leaves. That's right. God still came. If God did not come to them, even in their fig leaves, there would have been no hope for them. But what did they do? When God arrived to them, in verse 14 and 15 says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the first promise of the coming Messiah. And as our first parents, fig leaves and all, as they were pointed forward to the future redemption, pointed forward to the coming of Jesus, and as they looked down the ages to the coming of Jesus, they accepted Jesus as their personal Savior. Yes, all they had on was fig leaves. But they saw Jesus. And when they saw Jesus, they accepted Christ as their personal Savior. Oh, that was their only hope. And once they accepted Christ as their personal Savior, then guess what happened? So let's put that down over here. 
Let's put that down as we are looking it down. The introduction of nakedness here it says. And then point number four. It says the plan of redemption was revealed to them. The plan of redemption was revealed to our first parents. And when our first parents accepted Christ, and they accepted Christ as their personal Savior, they accepted Him while they were wearing the fig leaves. Let us not forget that. While they had those fig leaves on is when they gave their hearts to Jesus. But what happened as soon as they accepted Christ? What happened as soon as they gave their hearts to Jesus as their personal Savior? What happened then? Let us now look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21 says, And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. What did God do? God gave them a coat of skins. Now how do you end up with a coat of skins? How are you able to have coats of skins? You know, you don't just shave the animal there you actually have to kill the animal in order to have its skins. So here, there was a death. There was a death that had taken place. And this, so therefore, when they accepted Christ, they had to see that there was a death. An animal had to die. And this animal was an animal that, it, that was a representation of the plan of redemption. And this is why when it says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world in John 1, 29, it was pointing forward to the coming Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, it says, The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So it must mean that this coat of skins was a lamb. It was a death of a lamb. And as this lamb was killed, and as they put their faith fully in Jesus Christ, and took that lamb as part of representing their death, that Adam and Eve received something very important. Notice here, they received a change of clothing. So our first parents received a change in their garments. Isn't this amazing? I want you to notice here, in the very beginning, they had a certain type of clothing. Sin came, and there was a change directly in their dress. So, in the very beginning, God gave them certain kind of clothing. There was a change in their dress. And as soon as they accepted the plan of redemption, there was again a change. Again. In their clothing. People tell me, oh, it doesn't matter what I wear. It matters what's in the heart. Well, you, if we look at the very beginning of the creation of God, yes, what was on the outside showed what was going on in the inside. In the very first place, they had a complete garment of light. When they sinned, they lost that garment of light. And then they made themselves fig leaves to try to make themselves a little bit more self-righteous. But they came to Jesus. They accepted Him as their personal Savior. And once they did that, there was a change again in their clothing. And the question to us is, what type of change is going to happen to you? Do you want to have this type of change? Do you want to have this type of experience? Then it's high time that we experience the plan of redemption. Volume 4, page 636. Volume 4, Testing for the Church, page 636. 
It says much unhappy feeling was created by those who were constantly urging the reform dress upon their sisters. With extreme as this reform seemed to constitute the sum and substance of their religion, it was the theme of conversation and the burden of their hearts, and their minds were thus diverted from God and the truth. They failed to cherish the spirit of Christ and manifest a great lack of true courtesy. Instead of prizing the dress for its real advantages, they seemed to be proud of its singularity. Perhaps no question has ever come up among us which has caused such development of character as has the dress reform. You see what happens to many people, they accept a change in their dress without the plan of redemption. And what happened to our first parents? What happened to Adam and Eve when they experienced that change? They lost their light. They lost their clothing of light. And they came before God. And when they came before God, what happened to them? They, came be they realized they had to come before God in their own righteousness. And what did they bring with them? They brought with them fig leaves. Brethren, any type of dress reform, any type of reformation in clothing that is not accompanied with a plan of redemption, with the acceptance of Christ as our personal Savior, with accepting the death of Christ on Calvary as my death, that is nothing more than a bunch of fig leaves. True dress reform comes only as a result of accepting Christ as our personal Savior. For this reason, volume 1, page 136. Volume 1, 136 says, I saw that the outside appearance is the index to the heart. So if you want to know what's inside the heart, you see what's on the outside appearance. So if you're out there telling me that, oh, don't worry, what's what is in my heart is counts. Well, I know what's in that heart because you're putting all sorts of signs on the outside telling me what's inside that heart. Why does God give us dress reform? Volume 1, 136, 137. I saw that the axe must be laid at the root of the tree. Such pride should not be suffered in the church. It is these things that separate God from His people and shut the ark away from them. Remember, we were studying about the people that bear the ark of God. Well, it is if we are allowing wrong principles of dress reform in the church, then we show that the ark is being shut away from God's people. Israel had been asleep to the pride and fashion and conformity to the world in the very midst of them. They advance every month in pride and covetousness, selfishness and love of the world. When their hearts are affected by the truth, it will cause a death to the world and they will lay aside the ribbons, laces and colors. And if they are dead, the laugh, the jeer, and the scorn of unbelievers will not move them. If we are truly dead to the world, what the world tells us is not going to affect us. If you came to a man that is laying down in a coffin, he is dead. And you come there at the funeral home and you look at him there and he's dead. And you look around to make sure that nobody's watching you. And then all of a sudden you tell him, I hate you. You look ugly. What does he tell you? What is his response? His response is nothing. Why not? Because he is dead. And are we dead to the world? Have we experienced that death? If we have, then what the world thinks about our dress does not affect us. They will feel an anxious desire to be separate from the world like their master. They will not imitate its pride, fashions, or customs. The noble object will ever be before them to glorify God and gain the immortal inheritance. This prospect will swallow up all besides of an earthly nature. God will have a people separate and distinct from the world. What is God going to have? He is going to have a people that are separate and distinct from the world. And as soon as they have a desire to imitate the fashions of the world that they do not immediately subdue, just so soon God ceases to acknowledge them as His children. If we have feelings to draw us towards the world, 
to draw us towards the fashion of the world, and we do not immediately subdue them, then we are no longer the children of God. If you are dressing contrary to the principles that are written in the Word of God, then don't tell me you're still a Christian because God does not recognize you as such. There must be a change. You must experience the plan of redemption. You must see the Lamb of God dying for you. And when you see Jesus giving up everything, Jesus the creator of the universe, He gave everything up to come here and die on Calvary just for what? For you and me. He gave it all and we think we have something to sacrifice. We call this sacrifice it's shameful to even think about such things as sacrifice. Now dress reform was given to the children of Israel. And why was it given to them? Let us look at Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 through 41. Numbers 15, 37 through 41. You remember we were talking about some statutes earlier, statutes and judgments. And we mentioned some statutes we do not necessarily apply specifically. We look at the principle behind it. Now let's, this is one of those statutes. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it, and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart, and your own eyes, after which ye used to go whoring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments, and be holy unto your God. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, to be your God, I am the Lord your God. Why was dress reform given to the children of Israel? Well, to them, a lot of, most of the people around them at that time were dressing usually appropriately in public, but God still gave them certain principles. He said that you must have on a ribbon of blue. Now, why did they have to have a ribbon of blue? It says here that it shall, when you look upon it, you'll remember the commandments of the Lord. So this particular ribbon of blue, whenever they saw it, they would immediately recognize, ah, oh, that means I need to be a commandment keeper. In Volume 1, Testament for the Church, page 524, after quoting Numbers 15, 38 through 41, it says, Here God expressly commanded a very simple arrangement of dress for the children of Israel for the purpose of distinguishing them from the idolatrous nations around them. So what was the purpose? It was for the purpose of identification. It was for a purpose of distinction, to make sure that they are distinct and separate from those other nations. As they looked upon their peculiarity of dress, they were to remember that they were God's commandment-keeping people, and that He had wrought in a miraculous manner to bring them from Egyptian bondage to serve Him, to be a holy people unto Him. They were not to serve their own desires or to imitate the idolatrous nations around them, but to remain a distinct separate people that all who looked upon them might say, These are they whom God brought out of the land of Egypt, who keep the law of Ten Commandments. An Israelite was known to be such as soon as seen, for God through simple means distinguished them as His. So the Israelite was immediately identified because of the ribbon of blue. And so it is today. We were able to identify that sister that I mentioned at the very beginning because of the way she was dressed. God's people are able to be identified by the way they dress. Continuing on the next paragraph. The order given by God to the children of Israel to place a ribbon of blue in their garments was to have no direct influence on their health. Only as God would bless them by obedience and the ribbon would keep in their memory the high claims of Jehovah and prevent them from mingling with other nations, uniting in their drunken feasts and eating swine's flesh and luxurious food detrimental to health. God would now have His people adopt the reformed dress, not only to distinguish them from the world as His peculiar people, but because a reform in dress is essential to physical and mental health. Notice here the several reasons why we have 
the principles of dress reform. Number one, the very first reason was identification. For the purpose of identification. An Israelite was known to be such as soon as seen. We as modern day Israel, we as reformers following the experiences of Elijah and John the Baptist, we are to be able to be identified by the way we dress. Then the second thing is, is also for our physical well-being. For our physical health. Notice there what it said. It is because a reformed dress is essential to physical and mental health. So physical health and mental health. So what the purpose here is, God gave us dress reform for these three reasons today. This is our ribbon of blue. If we wear this ribbon of blue properly, it will identify us as God's people. It will promote physical health and it will promote mental health. Are you interested? I know I am interested. I would like to have these things for my particular health. And also we can add one more because in the classification with identification we can also add the spiritual health. So we can even add that one. So if you want physical, mental and spiritual health you need to adopt the principles of dress reform. If you want to be identified as a child of God, a member of the royal family, a child of the king, then you need to understand the principles of dress reform and follow them faithfully. Second Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. You see in all of this, there are many people who will never understand the Word of God. They will never take time to read the Bible, but they will read us. For that reason, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5 says, Ye are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. So people are reading the Word of God, not only through scriptures, because many times they never will. They read it in our characters. What type of character are we showing to the world? What are we telling them about the kingdom of God? Now let us go through some specifics in regards to dress reform. You know, these principles, many times all of us will sit down and say, yeah, we can all agree with this, these principles. But we don't like the specifics. But well, we have to go to the specifics. And one question over the years that I keep running into is, how come every time we talk about dress reform, we talk about women? We talk about the sisters. Why don't we talk about the men? Unfortunately, today, in this modern era, we may have to start to be talking about men pretty soon, too. Because men are suddenly, in this day and age, also going after fashion. But the reason why, traditionally, women have been addressed more with fashion than men is because of this statement here in Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 94. Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 94. Pride and extravagance in dress are sins to which women is especially prone. Hence these injunctions relate directly to her. The reason being is because this happens to be something that women are more especially prone. They are more especially prone to follow after fashion than men are. Men have their problems and some of these other studies that we've had address men more directly. The first statement we want to look at is 1 Timothy 2 verses 9 and 10. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or pearls or gold or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. In the first place we must have modest apparel. Well, what is modesty? 
Well, in our very first illustration, what happened when Adam and Eve sinned? The more they, when they fell into sin, they tended towards nakedness. And so it is today, as we come into the presence of God, those who are falling further and further away from Him tend to go towards nakedness. And this is why when it says modest apparel, it means the opposite of going down into nakedness. It says with shamefacedness, meaning reserved or bashful. If we only understand what it means to be a little bit more reserved, we will understand this verse clearer. Sobriety, meaning sober, broidered or ornamented hair. In the book Education, page 248, Education, page 248 says, a, a person's character is judged by his style of dress. So your character is being judged by the way you dress. A refined taste, a cultivated mind will be revealed in the choice of simple and appropriate attire. Chaste simplicity in dress, when united with modesty of demeanor, will go far towards surrounding a young woman with the atmosphere of sacred reserve, which will be to her a shield from a thousand perils. Women are in great danger out there, and as, as society is plunging deeper and deeper into sin, women are placed in more and more of a dangerous situation. And even men are being placed in a more dangerous situation today than ever before. But it notice here, with a chaste simplicity in dress, when united by our conduct, by the way we act, will go far towards surrounding a young woman with an atmosphere of sacred reserve, which will be to her a shield from a thousand perils. So all these dangers will be protecting her from them because around her there is an atmosphere. What type of atmosphere are you putting around yourself? Are you per putting an atmosphere around you that is saying, this is sacred territory? Or are you opening the doors to temptation saying, come and see what you can get? It depends on you. Depends on the way you dress and depends on your conduct. Another statement we can also look up is in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. If we understood these verses properly and we applied them in our lives, if we carried out these principles that are in these verses right here, we would rarely, if ever, have to bring up the subject to dress reform. But it's because we do not understand these verses, or at least we do not put them into practice, that the subject of dress reform has to be brought up from time to time, and sometimes very often. Let us look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 5. Whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. What was the root here? The root was adorning the hidden man, adorning your character. If you experience true conversion, if you experience this type of relationship together with God, that you are adorning your spiritual nature and embellishing that spiritual nature, you will never waste your time with these outward adornings. Education, page 248. Education, page 248. At the same time, the young should be taught to recognize the lesson of nature. He hath made everything beautiful in its time. In dress, as in all else, it is our privilege to honor our Creator. He desires our clothing to be not only neat and healthful, but appropriate and becoming. You see, our God is the Creator of beauty. Just look around you. Look at what God has created. You look at the things of nature. You look at the animals. You look at the mountains. You look at the trees. You look at the rocks. It's so beautiful. Our God is the creator of beauty. But He's a creator of natural beauty. Oftentimes, I find people covering up the natural beauty that God has given them. To do what? To make themselves 
sick and deadly, beca dying because of all what they have put on their skin. In volume 4, page 142, as we talk about this sacred reserve, it does not mean that we, be, we, don't, we just dress in rags. It doesn't mean that. Volume 4, 142. My sister, bind your children to your heart by affection. Give them proper care and attention in all things. Furnish them with becoming garments that they may not be mortified by their appearance for this would be injurious to their self-respect. If we are truly developing the spiritual worth on the inside, if we're embellishing our moral character, our clothing on the outside will be becoming. It will be appropriate. It will be tasteful. It will not be there to mortify the appearance and injure self-respect. You have seen that the world is devoted to fashion and dress, neglecting the mind and morals to decorate the person. But in avoiding this evil, you verge upon the opposite extreme and do not pay sufficient attention to your own dress and that of your children. It is always right to be neat and to be clad appropriately in a manner becoming your age and station in life. So it is appropriate the way we dress it needs to be in accordance to our age, according to our station in life. Those things are all important because we are representing God's character to the world. So the questions that we need to ask ourselves in the principles address. The first question is found in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. The first question that you need to ask yourself is the way I'm dressing, does it glorify God? This is a very important question. Does it glorify God? Just think about it sometimes. Sometimes I wish that uh, some people would look in the mirror. I wonder sometimes if our sisters realize even how they're dressing. If they would look in the mirror, they may be shocked and may never again dress that way. Because to some of them, if I were to comment on what I saw on them, they may be shocked, they may blush, but they don't realize that they're doing it all the time. Another question that we can ask ourselves is found in 3 John verse 2. 3 John, verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. So the question here is health. Is it healthy? Well, let's take a look at another question. Proverbs 31, 21. Proverbs 31, verse 21. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. If you look at the margin, it says double garments. So here the question that I get from this verse is, is it appropriate to the weather? So is it, is it does it glorify God? Is it healthful? Is it appropriate to the weather? What does Satan do? Satan spends his time inventing certain things for a reason. Volume 4, page 629. Volume 4, 629. Many of our sisters are persons of good ability, and if their talents were used to the glory of God, they would be successful in winning many souls to Christ. Will they not be responsible for the souls they might have saved, had not extravagance in dress, and the cares of this world so crippled and dwarfed their God-given powers that they felt no burden of the work? Satan invented the fashions in order to keep the minds of women so engrossed with the subject of dress that they could think of but little else. What does Satan do? He invents the fashions in order to keep the minds of our sisters so engrossed with the subject of fashion, they have no time for spirituality. 
like the sister I mentioned. She spent all morning long. She got up early in the morning just to get her hair ready. That's quite engrossed in fashion. There's no time to think of anything else. The next question we can think of is in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. It is important for us not only to have, have our clothing appropriate to the weather, to have our clothing to honor and glorify God and according to health, but it's also very important to be clean. It says here that we are the temple of God. Whoever defiles the temple of God, God will destroy. So it's important for us to have clean clothing. So a question we can ask ourselves, is my clothing clean? It is interesting as we look at the experience of the priesthood back in the days of the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament. In Volume 6, Testing for the Church, page 96. Volume 6, Testing for the Church, page 96. It talks a little bit about the experience of Aaron and the priests. Volume 6, page 96. There should be no carelessness in dress. For Christ's sake, whose witnesses we are, we should seek to make the best of our appearance. In the tabernacle service, God specified every detail concerning the garments of those who ministered before Him. Thus we are taught that He has a preference in regard to the dress of those who serve Him, especially for those in the ministry. Very specific were the directions given in regard to Aaron's robes, for his dress was symbolic. What was his dress? It was symbolic. So the dress of Christ's followers should be symbolic. Our dress, the way we dress, is symbolic. In all things we are to be representatives of Him. Our appearance in every respect should be characterized by neatness, modesty, and purity. But the Word of God gives no sanction for the making of changes in apparel merely for the sake of fashion, that we may appear like the world. Christians are not to decorate the person with costly array or expensive ornaments. And what about when we appear in the sanctuary before God? What happens when we appear directly here on Sabbath? How should we come? It's a tragedy when many times I see people come to church. They come as if they came off the field working on their farm. Here's what it says, volume 6, 355. Many need instruction as to how they should appear in the assembly for worship on the Sabbath. They are not to enter the presence of God in a common clothing worn during the week. All should have a special Sabbath suit to be worn when attending service in God's house. How, what should we act like? We should have a special clothing when we come specifically in the house of God. Not to be the same clothing that is worn during the week. While we should not conform to worldly fashions, we are not to be indifferent in regard to our outward appearance. We are to be neat and trim, though without adornment. The children of God should be pure within and without. In Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5, we have another important biblical principle in regards to clothing. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. What does this say? It says that we are not to wear the clothing of the opposite sex. This is a big issue today, especially here in America and in the Western world. The issue of women wearing pants. We don't have the issue of when men wearing dresses yet. But who knows, the way things are going on in this world, anything is possible. But the fact is that we are not to wear each other's clothing. Oh, but does it refer to pants? Well, let's find out. 
Keep in mind that Ellen G. White was a woman. So this is being written down from a woman's perspective. Volume 1, page 457. Now a woman's perspective inspired by God. Volume 1, page 457. I saw that God, God's order has been reversed and His special directions disregarded by those who adopt the American costume. I was referred to Deuteronomy 22.5, the same verse we just read. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination to the Lord thy God. God would not have His people adopt the so-called reformed dress. It is immodest apparel, wholly unfit for the modest, humble followers of Christ. So this American costume is totally unfit for those who follow Jesus. Are you following Jesus? Then you cannot adopt the American costume that was prevalent back in her day. Now what was that American costume? Let's go on a little bit further. It says there is an increasing tendency to have the women in their dress and appearance as near like the other sex as possible and to fashion their dress very much like that of men. But God pronounces it abomination. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. What does it say here? It says there is an increasing tendency in women to have their, to be in their dress and appearance as near like the other sex as possible. And women tell me, oh, these are women's pants. Well, what does it say here? The closer you dress to that of men, God calls it abomination. I don't call it abomination. You know, someone asked me, do you, do you care if I wear pants or not? I really don't care, to be honest with you. I don't care what you wear. But God cares what you wear. God calls it abomination, so what must I do? I must also call it an abomination because God calls it such. It's not to be hard on people, but if it says this in this verse, either we believe it or we don't. Now we may say, well, I don't believe the spirit of prophecy. Well, then tell us you don't believe it. Then you don't belong as an Adventist. But what about the Bible? The Bible verse was very plain. Shall we throw that away too? No, we need to throw away our opinions. We need to throw away our feelings. Put that to the side and accept, thus saith the Lord. It says, those who feel called out to join the movement in favor of women's rights and the so-called dress reform might as well sever all connection with the third angel's message. So if you want to go into this so-called dress reform, this American costume, if you want to adopt that, then you might as well sever all your connection with the third angel's message. Don't bring it into the church. No, dis disconnect yourself from the third angel's message. Disconnect yourself from the church if you insist on having that. The spirit which attends the one cannot be in harmony with the other. There's two different spirits controlling each one. If a woman, if you desire to wear pants, you have a different spirit that is controlling you. The scriptures are plain upon the relations and the rights of men and women. Spiritualists have to quite an extent, adopted this singular mode of dress. Seventh-day Adventists who believe in the restoration of the gifts are often branded as spiritualists. Let them adopt this costume and their influence is dead. The people would place them on a level with spiritualists and would refuse to listen to them. Today they'd be placed on the same common level with the rest of the world. And what was this American costume? Let's be a little bit more specific. Volume 1, page 465. Volume 1, page 465. The above described dress we believe to be worthy of the name of the reform short dress. You can read above to find out what that dress was. It is being adopted at the Western Health Reform Institute and by some of the sisters at Battle Creek and other places where the matter is properly set before the people. In wide contrast with this modest dress is the so-called American costume resembling very nearly the dress worn by men. So what was the American costume? It was not men's clothing, but it was clothing that very nearly resembled men's clothing. And what was it? It consisted of a vest, pants, and a dress resembling a coat and reached about halfway from the hip to the knee. This dress I have opposed. So they had what? They had pants and they had a dress that came down about halfway between the, down the knees. This 
dress was opposed. What about with no dress at all and just the pants? How much more that would be opposed? This dress I have opposed from what has been shown me as in harmony with the Word of God, while the other I have recommended as modest, comfortable, convenient, and helpful. When we talk about immodest apparel in 1 Timothy 2 verse 9, it clearly speaks against women wearing pants. In, on page 459 of Volume 1, Volume 1, 459, there is still another style of dress which is adopted by a class of so-called dress reformers. They imitate the opposite sex as nearly as possible. What do they do? They imitate the opposite sex as nearly as possible. They wear the cap, pants, vest, coat, and boots the last of which is the most sensible part of the costume. Those who adopt and advocate this style of dress carry the so-called dress reform to very objectionable lengths. Confusion will be the result. What will happen? This will cause confusion. So women wearing pants is going to cause confusion. Another problem is there's a certain spirit that goes along with this type of dress. Volume 1, page 457 to 458. Volume 1, 457 to 458. With a so-called dress reform, there goes a spirit of levity. We're talking about this spirit, this so-called dress reform of the American costume. With the so-called dress reform, there goes a spirit of levity and boldness, just in keeping with the dress. Modesty and reserve seem to depart from many as they adopt that style of dress. People tell me, oh, when I wear pants, then I can do things that I couldn't do with the dress. Yeah, that is the very problem. The problem is not the change, needing to change the dress. The problem is needing to change the activities that call forth this problem. I was shown that God would have us take a course consistent and explainable. Let the sisters adopt the American costume and they would destroy their own influence and that of their husbands. They would become a byword and a derision. Our Savior says, Ye are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. There is a great work for us to do in the world and God would not have us take a course to lessen or destroy our influence with the world. And now there's another problem. Another problem also exists. And that problem, we look again here in volume 1, page 457. There is an increasing tendency to have women in their dress and appearance as near like the other sex as possible and to fashion their dress very much like that of men, but God pronounces it abomination. Now notice here it mentions two specific words. Two words are mentioned here that are a problem that God calls abomination. These two words, it says, in their dress and appearance. Now, when we're talking about dress, we know what we're talking about here. We're talking about the things that we put on. But what is this appearance? What is this appearance of that look like the opposite sex? We see clearly dress, when a woman wears pants, things of that nature, she is dressing like a man. But what else is there to show her appearance? Well, God called, whatever it is that shows the appearance, is here called an abomination. God calls it abomination. Well, what is that appearance? Let us look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. It, when we're talking here about dress, we're talking about the clothing. Appearance is the way we look. And so when a woman here, it says, when a woman has short hair or when a man has long hair, God calls it abomination. 
I don't call it abomination. The church didn't decide to call it abomination. God calls it abomination. And because God calls it abomination, and we are His servants, we also must call it what God calls it. We must call it an abomination. So if a woman is wearing short hair, or if a man is wearing a long hair, that is called abomination. Now in Volume 1, Testing for the Church, page 60, Volume 1, page 60, it mentions there that when Jesus comes again, Jesus being a man, his hair shall be on his shoulders. That means that it, we must make sure that a woman's hair must be distinctly longer than shoulder length hair. And likewise with a man, we, although we have much shorter hair today than shoulder length hair, it is because of the principle that God gave to us in the time of Paul in the Romans, where he says, where, wherever he went, he tried to be as much as possible like the people without compromising principle. And so, if the people today, if all men began to wear long hair, we could wear it shoulder length. But if all the women, but we could not wear it down like everybody else, because that would be violating principle. Let's keep in mind, there is an increasing tendency to have women in their dress and appearance as near like the other sex as possible, and to fashion their dress very much like that of men. But God pronounces it abomination. Now what about artificial hair? What about artificial hair and pads that people put on? In the book, Healthful Living, page 190. Healthful Living, page 190. The unnatural heat caused by artificial hair and pads about the head induces the blood to the brain, producing congestion and causing the natural hair to fall off. So here it brings in what? It becomes bad for our health to use artificial hair and pads. Another problem, Volume 4, Testing for the Church, page 635. Volume 4, page 635. It says, Many a style of dress that was inappropriate and even ridiculous has been generally adopted because it was the fashion. So because fashion, even if it's ridiculous, we accept it. That's preposterous. Among these pernicious fashions were the large hoops which frequently caused indecent exposures of the person. In contrast with this was presented a neat and modest becoming dress which would dispense with the hoops and the trailing skirts and provide for the proper clothing of the limbs. But dress reform comprised more than the shortening of the dress and the clothing of the limbs. It included every article of dress upon the person. It lifted the weights from the hips by suspending the skirts from the shoulders. It removed the tight corsets which compressed the lungs, the stomach and other internal organs and induced curvature of the spine and an almost countless train of diseases. Dress reform properly provided for the protection and development of the entire part of the body. Now here is an interesting thing. It says these things, corsets and other stuff, they induce the curvature of the spine. It's important for us to understand the principles because fashions change constantly. Well today there is another fashion that causes curvature of the spine. And that is what happens when women have to constantly walk on their tippy toes. When they have to have such high heels. And I see men are starting to have some high heels too. But women was even worse because they not only had high heels, but they have to stand like on a little pencil somewhere. Put their entire weight on the pencil. That is absolutely ridiculous. And you should try it out sometimes. When you lift up your, uh, your feet up on tippy toes, what happens? If you do not cause a curvature of the spine, if you keep your spine straight and you walk on tiptoes, you're going to end up falling over. So what has to happen is, when you lift up your feet like that, you also have to curve your spine. And once you curve your spine, you do it for long enough, what does it cause? It causes curvature of the spine. Is that healthy? Absolutely not. Many diseases are caused simply because your spine is bent out of shape. Another problem that we have is cosmetics. Healthful Living, page 189. Healthful Living, 189. Many are ignorantly injuring their health and endangering their lives by using cosmetics. When they become heated, the poison is absorbed by the pores of the skin and is thrown into the blood. Many lives have been sacrificed by this means alone. 
many people have lost their lives by what? By simply the use of cosmetics. Because once they put all those chemicals on their face and on their fingers and wherever else they may put them, when they become heated up, what happens? It goes directly inside the skin and inside the bloodstream. And many lives have been destroyed by that means alone. Healthful Living, again, page 191. Ladies may resort to cosmetics to restore the tint of the complexion, but they cannot thus bring back the glow of healthful feeling to the heart. That which darkens and makes dingy the skin also clouds the spirits and destroys cheerfulness and peace of mind. Do you want cheerfulness? Do you want happiness? Then don't put on cosmetics. Let the beautiful nature of God shine out from you. Now, if you think your skin is all too pale and everything else, well, go outside in the sunshine. Your body needs it. If you allow the sunshine to come inside your body and color, give color to your skins, you'll be much healthier for it, much more healthier than the cosmetics that you may be putting on. Another point we need to talk about is the length of the dress. Volume 1, Test Me for the Church, page 464. Volume 1, page 464. In regard to my wearing the short dress, I would say I have but one short dress which is not more than the finger's length shorter than the dresses I usually wear. I have worn this short dress occasionally. In the winter I rose early and putting on my short dress, which did not require to be raised by my hands to keep it from dragging in the snow. I walked briskly from one to two miles before breakfast. I have worn it several times to the office when obliged to walk through the light snow or when it was very wet or muddy. Four or five sisters of the Battle Creek Church have prepared for themselves a short dress to wear while doing their washing and house cleaning. A short dress has not been worn in the streets of the city of Battle Creek and has never been worn to meeting. My views were calculated to correct the present fashion, the extreme long dress trailing upon the ground and also to correct the extreme short dress reaching about to the knees, which is worn by a certain class. So you have the extremes. One is dragging on the ground and the other comes to the knee. So if your dress is down to the knees, that means that's an extreme short dress. That's also one of those extremes that we are to shun. By wearing the dress reaching about to the top of a woman's gaiter boot, we shall escape the evils of the extreme long dress and shall also shun the evils and authority of the extreme short dress. Page 521, volume 1, page 521. In answer to letters of inquiry, from many sisters relative to the proper length of the reform dress, I would say that in our part of the state of Michigan, we have adopted the uniform length of about nine inches from the floor. In volume three, Selected Messages, page 227 to 228, explains this nine inches. It doesn't mean we stand with a ruler next to the door of the church and sit down and say, okay, let's find out how many are coming nine inches. Here's what it says. Question, does not the practice of the sisters in wearing their dresses nine inches from the floor contradict testimony number 11, which says that they should reach somewhat below the top of the lady's gaiter boot? Answer, the proper distance from the bottom of the dress to the floor was not given me in inches. It was not given me in inches. But three companies of females passed before me with their dresses as follows with respect to length. The first were of fashionable length, burdening the limbs, impeding the step, and sweeping the streets and gathering the filth, the evil results of which I have fully stated. This class, who were slaves to fashion, appeared feeble and languid. The dress of the second class, which passed before me, was in many respects as it should be. The limbs were well clad. They were free from the burden which the tyrant fashion had imposed upon the first class, but had gone to the extreme in the short dress as to disgust and prejudice good people and destroy in a great measure their own influence. This is the style of influence of the American costume taught and worn by many at our home, Danville, New York. It does not reach to the knee. It needs not, I need not say that this style of dress was shown to be too short. A third class passed before me with cheerful countenance and free elastic step. Their dress was the length I have described as proper, modest, and healthful. It cleared the filth of the street and sidewalk a few inches under all circumstances, such as ascending and descending steps, etc. So you should be able to go up and down steps without it going down on the ground. As I have before stated, the length was not given me in inches. So it was not given to her in inches, but 
As she mentioned, it was approximately nine inches that they decided upon that was approximation for it. Now, there are many other principles, and we want to be brief on this, so you can go ahead and study this a little bit deeper. But these are the basic principles of dress reform. But when you understand these principles, should you adopt it at once or should you change gradually? Volume 4, page 640. Volume 4, page 640. Some have said, after I wear out this dress, I will make the next plainer. Now if conformity to the fashions of the world is right and pleasing to God, where is the need of making a change at all? But if it is wrong, is it best to continue in the wrong any longer than is positively necessary to make the change? Should you continue longer than what the necessary time to make the change? Right here we would remind you of the zeal and earnestness, the skill and perseverance you manifested in preparing your dress according to fashion. Would it not be praiseworthy to manifest at least equal earnestness to make it conform to the Bible standard? Precious God-given time and means were used in fashioning those garments. And now what are you willing to sacrifice to correct the wrong example you have given to others. So, it says here that when you were following fashion, what did you do? It didn't matter how much you spent. And now, when, we say, when it's time to make the changes properly, what do we say? Oh, it's, I can't make the change too quickly. Oh, but if you were so zealous for fashion, why not be zealous for the truth? Why not take the changes immediately, just like you did back when you were dealing with fashion? Now, what is the major problem with this whole subject of fashion? Volume 4, 647 to 648. Volume 4, 647, 648. Do not, my sisters, trifle longer with your own souls and with God. I have been shown that the main cause of your backsliding is your love of dress. This leads to the neglect of grave responsibilities and you find yourself with scarcely a spark of the love of God in your hands. Without delay, renounce the cause of your backsliding because it is sin against your own soul and against God. If you are violating these principles of dress reform, you are violating, you are sinning against your own soul, you are sinning against God. Be not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Why? Fashion is deteriorating the intellect and eating out the spirituality of our people. What is often the major reason for loss of spirituality? It says, fashion is deteriorating the intellect and eating out the spirituality of our people. Obedience to fashion is pervading our Seventh-day Adventist churches and is doing more than any other power to separate us from God. It is what? It is doing more than any other power to separate our people from God. That's right. This issue of fashion, more than anything else, is separating us from God. What shall we do? Is dress reform a point of religious dis of church discipline? Should we implement church disciplinary action, even disfellowshipment of members over the principles of dress reform? Let me read. Keep in mind, this is God's Word. I have been shown that our church rules are very deficient. All exhibitions of pride in dress, which is forbidden in the Word of God, should be sufficient reason for church discipline. What does it say? All exhibitions of pride in dress, which is forbidden in the Word of God, should be sufficient reason for church discipline. If there is a continuance in face of warnings and appeals and entreaties to still follow the perverse will, it may be regarded as proof that the heart is in no way assimilated to Christ. Self and only self is the object of adoration, and one such professed Christian will lead many away from God. In Testimonies of the Ministers, page 128. Testimonies of the Ministers, 128. The test of discipleship is not brought to bear as closely as it should be upon those who present themselves for baptism. It should be understood whether those who profess to be converted are simply taking the name of Seventh-day Adventists or whether they are taking the stand on the Lord's side to come out from the world and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. 
when they give evidence that they fully understand their position, they are to be accepted. But when they show that they are following the customs and fashions and sentiments of the world, they are to be faithfully dealt with. If they feel no burden to change their course of action, they should not be retained as members of the church. What does it say here? If we continue in those practices, they should not be maintained as members of the church. The Lord wants those who compose His church to be true, faithful stewards of the grace of Christ. For this reason, volume 4, page 648, it says, There is a terrible sin upon us as a people, that we have permitted our church members to dress in a manner inconsistent with their faith. We must arise at once and close a door against the allurements of fashion. Unless we do this, our churches will become demoralized. What will be the result? Our churches will become demoralized. At the same time, we should not dress strange for the sake of dressing strange. Messages to the Young People, page 350. Messages to the Young People, 350. Christians should not take pains to make themselves gazing stocks by dressing differently from the world. But if in, if in accordance with their faith and duty and respect to their dressing modestly and healthfully, they find themselves out of fashion, they should not change their dress in order to be like the world. But they should manifest a noble independence and moral courage to be right if all the world differs from them. If the world introduces a modest, convenient and healthful mode of dress, which is in accordance with the Bible, it will not change our relation to God or to the world to adopt such a style of dress. So if the world is adopting good principles, there is nothing wrong with adopting those principles. We are not to be different for the sake of being different. Christians should follow Christ and conform their dress to God's Word. They should shun extremes. They should humbly pursue a straightforward course irrespective of applause or of censure and should cling to the right because of its own merits. Another statement, volume 1, page 275 to 276. I have frequently received letters of inquiry in regard to dress, and some have not rightly understood what I have written. The very class that have been presented before me as imitating the fashions of the world have been very slow and the last to be affected or reformed. That's one class. Another class who lack taste and order in dress have taken advantage of what I have written and gone to the opposite extreme. Considering that they were free from pride, they have looked upon those who dress neatly and orderly as being proud. Oddity and singularity in dress have been considered a special virtue by some. Such take a course which destroys their influence over unbelievers. They disgust those whom they might benefit. So we find here there are two extremes. God does not want us to go to either extreme. You see, Satan doesn't care which extreme you go on so long as you find one to go on. We must be balanced in our understanding of this subject. Continuing on, while the visions have reproved pride in imitating the fashions of the world, they have also reproved those who were careless in regard to their apparel and lack cleanliness of person and dress. Especially have I been shown that those who profess present truth should have a special care to appear before God upon the Sabbath in a manner which would show that we respect the Creator who has sanctified and placed special honors upon that day. All who have any regard for the Sabbath should be cleanly in person neat and orderly in dress. For they are to appear before the jealous God who is offended at uncleanliness and disorder and who marks every token of disrespect. Some have thought it wrong to wear anything upon their heads but a sunbonnet. Such go to great extremes. It cannot be called pride to wear a neat plain straw or silk bonnet. Our faith, if carried out, will lead us to be so plain in dress and zealous of good works that we shall be marked as peculiar. But when we lose taste for order and neatness in dress, we virtually leave the truth, for the truth never degrades but elevates. What does the truth do? The truth never degrades but elevates. And so this whole issue, even of the bonnets, the whole issue of the bonnets, there's, we don't find the evidence that we need to have that. 
But what happens here? People just want to go to one extreme or another. Unbelievers look upon Sabbath keepers as degraded. And when persons are neglectful of their dress and coarse and rough in their manners, their influence strengthens unbelievers in this conclusion. Page 274, Volume 1, page 274. We often think that, oh, we need to be brought down on a level. Do we need to be brought down on a level? Is that what we need to do? Let's take a look. There is an evil among some of the poor, which will certainly prove their ruin unless they overcome it. They have embraced the truth with their coarse, rough, uncultivated habits, and it takes some time for them to see and realize their coarseness. And that it is not in accordance with the character of Christ. They look upon others who are more orderly and refined as being proud. And you may hear them say, the truth brings us all down upon a level. But it is an entire mistake to think that the truth brings the receiver down. It brings him up, refines his taste, sanctifies his judgment, and if lived out, is continually fitting him for the society of the holy angels in the city of God. The truth is designed to bring us all up on a level. Not to bring us all down on a level, but to bring us up on a level. For this reason, volume 1, page 464. I would advise those who prepare for themselves a short dress for working purposes to manifest taste and neatness in getting it up. Have it arranged in order to fit the form nicely. Even if it is a working dress, it should be made becoming and should be cut after a pattern. Sisters, when about their work, should not put on clothing which would make them look like images to frighten the crows from the corn. Oh, this, I like this statement. You know, we're not to dress in such a way to look like scarecrows, to scare people away and to scare the crows from off the corn. That is not the intention that God has for us. Oh, no, no, no. It is more gratifying to their husbands and children to see them in a becoming, well-fitting attire than it can be to mere visitors or strangers. Some wives and mothers seem to think it is no matter how they look when about their work and when they are seen only by their husbands and children. But they are very particular dressed in taste for the eyes of those who have no special claims upon them. Is not the esteem and love of husband and children more to be prized than that of strangers or common friends? The happiness of husband and children should be more sacred to every wife and mother than that of all others. Christian sisters should not at any time dress extravagantly, but should at all times dress neatly, modestly, and healthfully as their work will allow. Before we come to our conclusion, I would like to share a particular experience found in evangelism. Page 270 to 272. A sister who had spent some weeks at one of our institutions in such and such a place said that she felt much disappointed in what she saw there and heard there. Before accepting the truth she had followed the fashions of the world in her dress and had worn costly jewelry and other ornaments. But upon deciding to obey the word of God she felt that its teachings required her to lay aside all extravagance and superfluous adorning. She was taught that Seventh-day Adventists did not wear jewelry, gold, silver, or precious stones, and they did not conform to worldly fashions in their dress. When she saw among those who professed the faith such a wide departure from Bible simplicity, she felt bewildered. Had they not the same Bible which she had been studying and to which she had endeavored to conform her life? Had her past experience been mere fanaticism? Had she misinterpreted the words of the Apostle? The friendship of the world is enmity with God, for whomsoever will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Mrs. D., a lady occupying a position in the institution, was visiting at Sister Such and Such's room one day, when the latter took out of her trunk a gold necklace and chain and said she wished to dispose of this jewelry and put the proceeds into the Lord's treasury. Said the other, Why do you sell it? I would wear it if it was mine. Why, replied sister such and such, when I received the truth, I was taught that all these things must be laid aside. Surely they are contrary to the teachings of God's word. And she cited her hearers to the words of the apostle, Paul and Peter, upon this point. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, etc. Down further, in answer, the lady displayed the gold ring on her finger, given her by an unbeliever. And she said she thought it no harm to wear such ornaments. 
We are not so particular, she said as formally. Our people have been over scrupulous in their opinions upon the subject of dress. The ladies of this institution wear gold watches and gold chains and dress like other people. It is not good policy to be singular in our dress, for we cannot exert much influence. We inquire, is this in accordance with the teachings of Christ? Are we to follow the word of God or the customs of the world? Our sister decided that it was the safest to adhere to the Bible standard. Will Mrs. D and others who pursue a similar course be pleased to meet the result of their influence in that day when every man shall receive according to his works? You see, brethren, there is a judgment day. We're going to have to answer for everything that we are doing. God's word is plain. Its teachings cannot be mistaken. Shall we obey it just as he has given it to us? Or shall we seek to find out how far we can digress and yet be saved? Shall we see how far we can get close to the world and still make it to the kingdom of God? Is that what your interest is? We would that all connected with our institutions would receive and follow the divine light and thus be enabled to transmit light to those who walk in darkness. Conformity to the world is a sin which is sapping the spirituality of our people and seriously interfering with their usefulness. It is idle to proclaim the warning to the world while we deny it in the transactions of our daily life. After we've had this study today, I ask you a question. Are you preparing to go to the promised land? Do you have on the ribbon of blue the dress reform principles for our time? If not, now is the time. Now is our day of opportunity. In 2 Corinthians, chapter 6 verse 2 I read the following for he saith I have heard thee in a time accepted and in a day of salvation have I succored thee behold now is the accepted time behold now is the day of salvation now right now is your opportunity now is the opportunity to accept the Lamb of God as your personal Savior and for him to give you not fig leaves but lamb's wool, which is your choice? Do you want Christ's righteousness with this symbol? My appeal to you is today, now is the time. Come to the Lord fully and faithfully. Amen.